Dear Lord, we're here today just thanking you for your wondrous love, your marvelous love, and uh, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, today, Lord, that we can receive uh, forgiveness through him. And uh, Lord, we just ask and pray as we're here today, as we gather and congregate here uh, in your name, that you would just bless the service today, bless the pastor as he brings the word, uh, bless each and every person here already and those still to come, and we ask for your Holy Spirit amongst us today. In the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior, we all say, Amen. 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 And you may book of the Bible, that would be what book? Revelation. Revelation, yes. Let's turn there and find chapter 5. While you're turning there, I'll tell you a little bit about life at 62. Pam <laughs> uh, took me out to the beach cities for a progressive picnic and came down with a urinary tract infection. So we diverted and went to urgent care. <laughs> then my dog decided to go out at 3 in the morning this morning and hunt animals. <laughs> I don't know what she found, but I ran out with my flashlight and got her back inside so Pam can get the proper rest she needs for her UTI. <laughs> There's something else I was going to tell you about the glories of being 62, and I just forgot. So. <laughs> anyway, we're all in good shape for the shape we're in. Amen? It's nice to see all of you here this morning. Let's pray one more time. Our Father in heaven, we need you. We need the strength of your presence and your working power in our lives. We need the word to speak to us. Lord, we see the prophecy of your Bible is happening right before our very eyes, and yet many in the world don't even know it. And so, Lord, we don't want to be guilty of that. We want to be in tune with where you are and what you're trying to do. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you anoint our eyes today with eye salve so that we will be able to see as you would have us to see. So give us the Holy Spirit, Lord, and help us to forget about all the trivial things that might distract us. And may we be dialed in to you and your glory and your wonderful word. I thank you for each person here, Lord. I pray your blessing upon them for having the spirit of faith to take this time on a Sunday to be with God's people in your house, Lord. Amen. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, it was on September 11, 1990, in a joint session of Congress, that the then President, George Bush Sr., began to talk of a new world order. Does anybody remember that? Yes. Way back in 1990. Yes. Seven years later, 1997, a book was published titled, The Roles of the United States, Russia, and China in the New World Order. That was 1997. Did you get those countries? Yeah. United States, China. Russia, <laughs> and China. <laughs> Bad impersonation, I know. Well, fast forward 25 years later, two weeks ago, President Biden spoke of a new world order. And then last week, the foreign ministers of Russia and China spoke of the new world order. Just wow. Now, I don't want to take this in a conspiratorial way because there's a twist now. A lot of time has passed since 1990 when we first heard it on September 11. Did you catch that? A lot has passed, a lot of time has passed since then, and I see, you know, as far as where you may go in a conspiratorial way, I see there is a twist now to all this. 
it seems that there may be competing ideas going on right now about how this new world order should be, which could be cause for more than a new world order, it could be a new world war. I mean, these are very, very tenuous times because when I hear Russia and China talking about their version of a new world order, I just don't see it as being President Biden's version. And I say, wow, where are we going? It appears evident that some big things are looming for our world in these days in which we find ourselves living. I'm so glad that when I prayed to the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, that as I asked him about what I should preach to my congregation, he has led me before the resumption of this New World Order talk to begin preaching on the book of Revelation. And no sooner had I started than did this talk begin um, with President Biden. And I'm like, wow. The Lord really does lead. Because I feel like this is one of my, the greatest services I could bring to my church people is to equip them concerning where all of this is heading geopolitically and prophetically. To equip them and prepare them and also, maybe most importantly, give us all a sense of confidence. If you're a believer and you read the book of Revelation, even though there is that shock and awe in all of it, as a believer, we read the end and we go away, in spite of some things that are frightening to see in the book, we go away feeling very confident. Amen. When I close the book of Revelation, when I read the last page, I feel a lot of peace. And I hope you do too. Amen. Well, last week we were able to go to chapter 4, which reveals the heavenly throne and worship. That's what we saw. We saw the heavenly throne where God the Father sat. And we saw these angelic beings of the highest order. And we saw this incredible worship. And so I want us to remember that, because despite all the geopolitical conflict and domestic upheaval that is going on right now, we saw, remember what we saw, we saw that there is the real place of supreme authority and control, and it's the throne of God. Amen. The real place of supreme authority and control is where God is in heaven right now. And so these leaders of the world, they are kicking up a lot of dust right now and making a lot of people in the world population to feel apprehensive, but the dust they're kicking up is merely dust in the wind. They think they're running the show, but the book of Revelation would say quite to the contrary, and they'll find out, much to their surprise, that God is still on the throne. Amen. I know we say that a lot, and at times it could become platitudinous. But right now, <laughs> with what we're seeing when we turn on our news stations or read our, our internet feeds, um, it never sounded any better to me. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the book of Revelation chapter 4, I see that. I see it, and it's so cool. And today we come to chapter 5. And we will have the elation of seeing that from that heavenly throne, it is Christ who is put in the place of supreme control. It seems like this world is going crazy. Who's in control of all this? It is Christ who is in control. So buckle up your pew belts, because here we go to chapter 5, right? And the first thing we see that John reveals in Revelation chapter 5 is a book with seven seals. We see a book with seven seals. 
Now let me see, I was adjusting my outline points. Can you still see it or am I too yep. tall? That's good. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to be accused of being too tall. That's never happened to me before. <laughs> All right. The book with seven seals. Verse number one. John says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now look at that word book. It is translated from the Greek word biblion, where we get our word Bible. Bible means book. It's not just a book, it is the Holy Bible. It's a holy book, right? Yeah. But that's the, the word, the Greek word biblion. Yeah. And in this context, the book is speaking of not a book that you're used to having that is bound and, uh, you know, with, with many pages of paper. What we're talking about in this context at the end of the first century, when John saw a book, he's speaking of a scroll. And it is made of such materials as either animal hide or papyrus, which comes from plant. So that's what they used, and it was rolled up as you would roll up a scroll, and that was their books. We also see, though, that it is sealed with seven seals. Now, this is a replication of what a scroll sealed with seven seals might look like in the first century. And so that's kind of a replication to the best that they could figure it out concerning archaeology and so forth and so on. But it was firmly sealed so that the contents could not be known until God's appointed time. So this is not any ordinary book. The magnitude of this book is something that John really can't hardly get over, as we're going to see. I mean, he is gripped by the idea that on the throne, God the Father is having in his right hand this scroll sealed with seven seals. Most Bible commentators agree concerning the magnitude of this scroll that it is no less than the title deed to planet Earth. Wow. Most Bible commentators, when they read the whole context of the book of Revelation, come away believing that what God the Father is holding in His right hand is the title deed to Earth. A will in Roman law bore the seven seals of seven witnesses on the threads secured that, that secured the tablets or parchments. So think about in Roman law, something as important as a will would have seven seals bearing the seals of the seven witnesses for such an important document. Now, something I've seen that I'm very impressed with, I've known about this idea of it being the title deed of earth for a long time, but I also like this thought. It is the book of God's decrees containing the full account of what God in His sovereign will has determined as the destiny of the world. So it's something like this. What God is holding in His right hand is going to determine the outcome of eternity. And so a title deed or a book of God's decrees that gives the full account of His sovereign will and what it is determined as the destiny of this world. So there we have the book with seven seals, a little understanding of that. Let's go on now to verses 2 through 5, the Lion of Judah and the book. All right? So John first saw the book, but now he sees something else. 
he's going to see what he describes as the Lion of Judah and the book. Let's read verses 2 through 5. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith to me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen and wow. Wow. <laughs> so, verse number three. The magnitude of this book and John's observation that no man in heaven or in earth or under the earth was able to open the book. Put your index finger under that word able. It comes from the Greek root word where we get the word power. And so when he said that no man was able, he was meaning that no man has the power to accomplish this action. Able means to have the power to accomplish an act, action. As far as opening this, this scroll and looking thereon, there was no man anywhere in all of history that could do that. This word able is also translated in our New Testament, can do. So concerning a man who had the power to take that scroll and execute it, no man can do. No man can do. So consequently, John wept. Look at verse number four. Did he weep a little? Yeah. He much. wept much. And he had good reason for weeping much. John realized that God's glorious redemption plan for his creation could never be com completed until the scroll was opened. So put yourself in his sandals. He's seen the glories of heaven. And now, where he is in this revelation, in his understanding of the scroll, the situation at this point to him seemed hopeless because no man could open the book. He realized that God's glorious redemption plan for his creation could only be completed on the basis of someone being able to execute what was contained in the book. Right? You follow that? Now, now you see why, why John wept much. Well, fortunately, we get to see in verse number 5 that one of the elders, you know the 24 that we studied last week, Pastor Tom believes are angels. One of the elders said, Weep not, verse number five. Don't cry, because the lion. behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed, has become victorious, has overcome. Whoever this is, referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has been victorious. He has prevailed. He has overcome to be able to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Basically, what this elder is informing John is the Messiah, which was promised in the Old Testament all the way back to the book of Genesis, is the one who has won the victory, and he is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Amen. So this term, it's the only time we see it in the Bible, this way, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. What is that reference concerning? Where does this concept come from? 
Well, like I say, it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. If you turn to Genesis chapter 49, concerning the tribe of Judah, the Bible promises that, promise that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. And that's the language we see when Jacob is giving the blessings to the, the 12 tribes of Israel. The sons... Is uh, the sons of Israel in verse number 9 of chapter 49 he says concerning the tribe of Judah Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey my son thou art gone up he stooped down he couched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up now here's the key verse the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So this universal kingship where that will involve the gathering of the people will come from the lineage of Judah. Does everybody see that? Who is likened in this blessing to a lion. And verse number 10 is, is so critical because a king is the one who has the scepter. And it says that this kingship will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. The lawgiver is analogous to the scepter. It's like a mace. It's like the staff that a king would hold and rest between his leg while he's sitting on the throne. So those two thoughts, the lawgiver is analogous with the scepter. It's seen as a mace, and it will not depart from between his feet until Shiloh come. And Shiloh is uh, identified as a he. So what about Shiloh? It's a cryptic name for Messiah. So this is talking about, in a not-so-patent way, many, many years before the Messiah's coming in the book of Genesis, it's talking about the promise that God gave that the Messiah would come from the lineage of Judah. But it goes further, not only from the lineage of Judah, if we turn back to uh, Revelation chapter 5, it's also tied to the root of David. It's tied to the root of David. And for this prophetical information, we go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And look what promise is given to David concerning his lineage. And again, this is developing the idea of the coming Messiah. If you look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and find, find verse number 12. Promise to David, and when thy days be fulfilled, remember he's the king of Israel, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, the root of David, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his what? Kingdom. Kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. 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 So a kingdom that is forever would be messianic, right? Now this is where this really gets interesting concerning prophecy. Because the most important component in understanding prophecy is the nation of Israel. Amen. All prophecy revolves around the nation of Israel. Again, we're talking about the Messiah being the root of David. But where this really gets interesting for you and me and the days in which we're privileged to live is scholarship says that the connotation here, the root of David, is that the nation of Israel has been cut down, but now one from the dynasty of David has the right to rule so that the tree will flourish again. 
This is exactly what has happened in our world concerning the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was cut down. And so think of a stump of a tree. That happened in 70 AD when the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem. And from that time forward, there never was a nation of Israel again for 1900 years. It was cut down. Think of a, a stump of a tree. But in the end of times, out of that stump would come out a new branch that would grow into a tree, a new beginning for Israel. And that happened in 1948. Amen. May 15th, 1948. A lot of people say, oh, you Christians, you, every Christian thought in his generation that Jesus' the second coming would happen. I know it's easy to think that way, but that's a very inaccurate understanding. Even though Christians thought that might have been true, there's no generation where Jesus could have come until the generation existing in 1948 and thereafter. Because there was no Israel. Now, miraculously, there is an Israel. Israel as a nation, rebirthed, is almost 75 years old. And so if we wonder why is all this stuff going on, it is because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the root of David. And he is the one who is going to be able to see to it that the nation of Israel flourishes again just as how God promised it would be for David, a kingdom that will be forever. Amen. Did I lose anybody on this? And so we are living in the times of times. It was one thing to be alive in 1948, and some of you were. I wasn't. I'm only 62. Some of you were alive when Israel became a nation again. It was a miracle. But now we're 75 years into this, and it is showtime, baby. Things are going on that are just incredible. Well, now let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Because... John has pointed out the book with seven seals. Yeah. John wept because no man was worthy to take the scroll and open it and look thereon. No one had the power, but then someone is revealed by the angel who does have the power. And this leads us to the Lamb and the book. As quickly as we see the symbolism of the lion, that transitions to another symbolism. It's no longer the lion, it is the what? The lamb. The lamb. Look at verses 6 and 7. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Weep no more, John. He came. He and out of the greatest hand of authority there could be, the right hand of God, he stepped up and took the scroll. I wish we could show a DVD of that. What a sight, eh? Just incredible. But here, the transition from the lion to the lamb, and this word lamb is used exclusively in Revelation of the resurrected and victorious Christ, the crucified Messiah. This revelation is all about Jesus and concerning the titles that you, he could be referred to in the revelation that's about him for 22 chapters. He's not given the title much of Christ or Son of God 26 times in the book of Revelation. He is given this title, The Lamb. 
And no other time in the New Testament is this word for lamb used. When we look at other references, it's another word for ram. The word amnos. But this is exclusive for Jesus in the book of Revelation. Why? Because this is the title that he is referred to exclusively as the resurrected and victorious Christ. The crucified Messiah. And that's what's so fascinating about verse number 6. John sees a lamb look as if it had been slaughtered, but yet it is standing and alive. Amen. How can you see such an incongruous sight? An innocent lamb having a look that it had been completely slaughtered, and yet it's standing and alive. Amen. What a sight! The lamb has been offered, yet it stands erect and alive in the sight of heaven. It's just incredible imagery here. Look at verse number 6. That's why he said, Lo, how can this be? In the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. A slain lamb alive. Just incredible. Then John sees, in the only way he can describe it, it's not to be taken literally. It had seven, seven horns and seven. and seven eyes. And John gives us a hint there that it's not literal. The seven eyes represent what? Seven spirits. The seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. What about this description of the slain ram, lamb who is living? But well, Warren Wiersbe exhorts us concerning our understanding of the book of Revelation. Listen to this short paragraph so you can stay on top of, of your understanding. The description of the lamb, if produced literally by an artist, would provide a grotesque picture. When understood symbolically, however, it conveys spiritual truth. Because seven is the number of perfection, we have here perfect power. That's the seven horns. In the Bible, the symbol of a horn is the symbol of power. The number seven is completion or perfection. So when John saw the Messiah, he saw one with perfect power to take the scroll. The seven eyes represent a being with perfect wisdom to take the scroll. And the fact that it involves every part of the earth sent forth at the end of verse 6 into all the earth is perfect presence. And so this is the idea of this one being worthy to take the scroll. Mm -hmm. So as we go forward from here to finish up chapter 5, let me just say that John has come to a point of relief and we should be at a point of relief also. Mm -hmm. If the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, no matter what is going on in this world, you are in good hands. Mm -hmm. You belong to the one who has perfect power, perfect wisdom, and perfect presence, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And all people are to be gathered to him. We will be gathered to him. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. Slide is up there for your verbatim response. I'm a perfectionist. Who is the Lamb? do that just to scare the devil away. <laughs> Alright? And verse number 7, this is the high point of John's vision. The Son of God takes the scroll from, his, from the hand of God the Father. And this means, this is why you need to come back next week, this means that the plan of God is ready to be carried out. And 
that Jesus is the one who will implement the plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verses 8 through 10 now we have the worship of the highest ranking angels. The response is worship. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or incense, which are the what? Prayers of the saints. Prayers of the saints. So everything is symbolic. These angels execute before the throne of God, the prayers of the saints who are on earth. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Let me give you a footnote. In understanding this, I want you to follow my logic and be aware of the different interpretations that are out there. But remember last week that I maintained after much study and consideration that I believe the 24 elders uh, who are on the thrones, the seats around the throne of God, that they are angels. And... Some people uh, might have been surprised by my interpretation because a lot of people believe the 24 represents the church with the 12 apostles and Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the reason why I like the idea of angels rather than that idea is because they are on thrones and when we look at the the traditional celestial hierarchy of angels, there's nine ranks. And the three highest are thrones, cherubim, and seraphim, as far as ranking angels. And that's what you have in this scenario. Around the throne and in the midst of God, you have the four beasts, which are cherubims or seraphims, the highest ranking. And it seems only logical that in that mix would be the third highest ranking thrones which the Apostle Paul also includes in Colossians 1.16 as a ranking of angel according to Jewish thought. If you look, he gives the ranking of angels in Colossians 1.16 and thrones is there. And these 24 sit on thrones around God's throne. So that's my, my understanding of it. And we're going to see more today, but some of you might be saying, and this is footnote. This is footnote here. Uh, but they're wearing these white garments. You, you know, look at verse, verse 4 of chapter 4. And around the throne were 20 and 4 seats, thrones. And upon the seats I saw 4 and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Doesn't that suggest redemption? You're wearing white raiment. You've been redeemed. That's the garment of the redeemed. And angels haven't been redeemed. So why do you say they're angels? Well, time out now. Angels also wear white garments. Matthew 28, 3. Remember on the resurrection morning? The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stones from the door and set upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was what? White, white as snow. White garments. You think white that's garments. the only verse in the Bible I have to back my point? Think not. How about Acts 1.10 when Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, angels, stood by them in what kind of apparel? White. So I understand people have their reasons to back their opinion, but to argue with me that they've got to be Israel and the church there as the 24 because of what they're wearing I say, what? Why can't they be angels because of what they're wearing? Inti Indy Miguel. What do angels wear? Yeah. And if you're taking notes, Mark 16, 5 would say the same, and John 20, 11 through 12. So the fact that 
these beings, as we've seen in verse number 8, are beings of constant worship, having the hearts, and the beings that hold the golden vials full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I think this is a very strong statement that they are angels, because in Judaism, the angels were considered to be carriers of the prayers of men. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They have these bowls, these vials, that contain, it's called odors or incense, but John identifies the odors or incense as being what? The prayers, the prayers of those who are on earth. And this explains the song that they sing in verses 9 and 10. It talks all about redemption. That is the content of the essence of the praise that is coming from the saints. It is their testimony that the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed them. And they're conveying that prayer and that praise as these angels who are carriers of the praise of men. Prayers of men, excuse me. That's why we see this new song. These beings have been singing a song. Uh, if you look back at uh, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, this is their song. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and cast down their crowns, saying, this is their testimony, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. This is their song. And they sing it over and again. We see it also in Revelation chapter 7 and verses 11 and 12. And Revelation chapter 11 verses 16 and 17. The 24 singing thus. But this is the only time we sing this song. And it just so happens that it comes from the vials, the incense of the, the, the saints. And this is our song that they're singing, that they're conveying before the throne of God. Because look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. That's our song, and that's exactly the same lyrics that we see in chapter 5, right? Right. So I may be getting old, and I don't even feel myself anymore now that I'm 62. I don't feel myself up here today, but I'm on top of this. You've got to believe me. Well, concerning this song that they sang, and the fact that it can be confusing because it says us, and yet it seems to be coming from these angels. What about that us? Well, of course we say that they are uh, communicating on behalf of the saints, but to give this just even a little stronger idea, if you look at any other translation of the Bible, New American Standard, New Living Translation, Revised Standard Version, uh, the word reads like this. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your, your blood. Instead of us, they have men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made, instead of us, them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So they kind of adjusted it to give the understanding of who these angels are referring to, and that's us. So the us is taken away, and men and them is replaced. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. I'm perfectly comfortable with the us in the King James Bible because I know reading the antecedent verse where this language is coming from, and then I look on later in the book and I see uh, these angels back to their old lyrics over and over again and it becomes very clear to me. So finally, you've been really, really good. But I have been too. I'm getting you through a whole chapter every sermon. That's really good. 
Don't try it at home. It'll take you hours. You'll break pencils. You'll get mad at your spouse for interrupting you. It takes hours. But we, we, we come to the last point, and again, reviewing the chapter, uh, the book with the seven seals, verse 1, the Lion of Judah and the book, verses 2 through 5, the Lamb and the book, verses 6 through 7, and then we have the worship as a result of the Lamb taking the book, the highest point of the chapter. Uh, we have the worship of the highest ranking angels, the 24 who are ranked as thrones in the celestial hierarchy, and then the highest two, the four beasts, which are either cherubim or seraphim. You take your choice. I'll leave that up to you. Now we come last to all the creation worships the Lamb. Look at verses 11 through 13. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. So there's the different rankings. Angels, cherubim, seraphim, thrones. Uh, and, uh, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000s and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and, glo and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. So kind of a, a hyperbole of worship. But if you look at one more verse, or set of verses, if you turn to Philippians chapter 2, this matches up with what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Um, if you're using the church Bible, I forgot to make a slide for that. That's page 868. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And that's exactly what we see as we end the chapter in verse number 14. And the four beasts said amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me now if you will. why the Lord has led me to preach on the book of Revelation because we are in scary times but when we have this information we should have confidence regardless. Amen? Amen. We're also in a time of atheism worldwide and as you walk around and engage in your daily life you are engaging with many people who are very proud of their humanism and their unbelief. Amen. But let me just say this, the only thing that could stop John from weeping very much was that there is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who can go to the throne of God and take the title deed of earth and make all things right. Amen. And so in all of this haughtiness and unbelief, if they want to have it their way, their way will be that this world will never stop weeping. Very much. They say they're humanistic. They say that it's all about the human race. Let me tell you, we are living in the year according to the Jewish calendar of 5782. Where did they get that number from? That number is that what the Jewish calendar says is when creation was. 57, 
82, 5,782 years ago. Man has had a long time to make this earth right. Thousands of years. Thousands of years. How many more thousands do we need? We have technology now, we have development, and what do we get out of it? We get a new war in Europe. We've regressed all the way back to 1939 with all of this great humanism that scoffs at our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. I would have to suggest to you that there's a lot of people going around that are loco. There's only one answer for the weeping that is very much in this world to stop. And the answer is the Lamb. Amen. Taking the scroll and opening it. Amen. And by His power, bringing the kingdom of God that we've been praying for forever when we pray that standard prayer, Thy kingdom come. Amen. So let me tell you, have confidence. Amen. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the only answer. And all of those who don't, they've got a lot to answer for. Ask these people who refuse to believe on him in Christ. Ask them, what is your hope? What is your hope? Jesus. Is it medicine? Because we just had a worldwide pandemic that shut the whole world down and medicine was clueless. Amen. <laughs> Is it the United Nations? The United Nations has been around for a long, long time, and all they were able to do is stand by and watch as Russia invaded Ukraine. Amen. And now we have two new world orders colliding, which could be World War III. Ask people who do not trust the Lord Jesus Christ, how many more thousands of years do, do you need to get this right, man? Forever without Jesus. I mean... To borrow a euphemism of our president, come on, man. <laughs> How many more thousands of years? So let's bow our heads. We're going to sing a song here right now uh, to help your confidence, to help your vision that no matter what, you are going to be that child of God that stays true. But if there are any here, you're not sure that you're saved. You're not sure that if your life ended today, you would go to heaven. You don't know with any confidence that you're right with God. You don't know that you have your sins forgiven. Uh, today is a day where we can make arrangements to get that all right. I can show you from the Bible how to be saved. The Bible talks about, we saw it in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, of those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus. And that can be you. You can be clean through the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. You can be clean by His offering for you on the cross. It's that simple. He is the Lamb as had been slain, but He is alive, and He is the one who is going to soon take the scroll. You need Jesus. Let today be that day that you make the decision. But let's sing this song now, and everybody use this song as your point of commitment to the Lord as we finished Revelation chapter 5.